Hi, welcome. So, uh, you're right, so you got a, a nice introduction already. So for the last 15 years, scientists from around the world have been constructing the largest experiment in the history of science, which is the Large Hadron Collider. So here you see outside of Geneva, Switzerland, where the, uh, the laboratory CERN is, and there's a, about a 17-mile ring, which is the accelerator uh, part of the Large Hadron Collider. And the, the, the real business is underground, about 100 yards, and then there are these huge... Uh, 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 caverns that hold the particle detectors, which I'll show you a little bit more of uh, in just a second. So the accelerator itself uh, is able to uses thousands of superconducting magnets and is able to harness the energy of a high-speed train and, and focus it into just this very narrow, thin beam of protons that you see inside the inside this graphic. And so it whizzes these uh, protons to nearly the speed of light, and they come into collisions uh, at these uh, big detectors. So when they collide, they recreate the conditions that are essentially shortly after the Big Bang, and they're, it's hot enough to ignite the productions of new kinds of particles. So these particles fly out and are captured by our huge particle detectors. So here are some pictures. Uh, you see a person for scale. It's much larger. It's really the size, of basically, of about a six-story building, and the, full, the whole thing is instrumented. So there are about 100 million electronic readouts. Uh, here you see everything is, you know, none of this is off the shelf, right? It's all uh, custom-designed uh, uh, hardware and electronics. And this is what you just heard about. Here you see one of the components and streams of fiber optic cables coming out of this thing. So uh, it produces... Uh, an enormous amount of data. So there's about 100 million uh, uh, sensors, which is sort of like a really, really nice uh, digital camera. But the big, uh, the big uh, difference is that we take 40 million photos a second. Okay, so that's like a f giving a digital camera to every American and having them snap off a photo every second. So that's our data payload. And uh, that turns out to be, uh, I didn't believe this, but apparently it's true. Uh, we have one subsystem of this detector that has more data coming out of it than the busiest uh, part of the Internet backbone. So, uh, so we're constantly dealing with this, and we have to throw away about 99.999% of all of our data. Uh, and the part that we keep is still about 15 petabytes a year. So it's a big data set. And we're doing all of this to test a theory uh, called the standard model of particle physics there. It's written in a very kind of uh, deceptively uh, compact form, and it predicts that the fundamental particles are some... Quite, okay, I'm not going to go into it, but it also predicts that there's something called the Higgs boson, which is the, in the middle, and it's the only particle that we haven't seen, and it's one of the big reasons why we're building the, uh, the Large Hadron Collider. But the Higgs boson is really, you know... Uh, it's important. It's an important piece. We haven't seen it, but it's an important piece for the theory to work. And we know the theory works incredibly well. In fact, we're able to make predictions and measure things with a precision that's equivalent to hitting a hole in one from New York to China. Okay, so the theory is, is just amazing. Um, and, uh, and the experiments are as amazing as well. So the Higgs is one thing that we're looking for, but it's really kind of the appetizer and the menu of uh, possible discoveries that we'll see. Um, there's also things like supersymmetry that go beyond what Einstein had told us about space and time, may explain what dark matter is. There are possible uh, scenario where you might see extra dimensions of space and time and even produce miniature black holes that you shouldn't worry about. Uh, so... So, uh, so all of that is very interesting, and I think that it will go down as like you know an enormous achievement in the history of science. But that's not really what I'm here to talk to you about today for a data, a big data conference. So instead, I want to look into the crystal ball and try to imagine what does what does uh, you know the science that we're doing at the LHC foretell about the future of science more broadly, and then try to make some sort of uh, jump from science into more of the business world, but that's going to be really uh, difficult, and uh, hopefully I'll just be saying something that will inspire someone out here to have a good, the next good idea. Um, so it's not just big data, it's also big science. So this is a paper that I wrote with 3,000 of my best friends. Uh, and uh, so we're doing, this is the, probably the largest collaboration uh, in science right now. Um, and just to give you a feel, uh, of the amount of communications we have going on. This is a plot of the number of presentations held at the laboratory, uh, the CERN laboratory by year. And you see it's basically growing exponentially. And in 2010, there were over 100,000 presentations. 
So it's definitely, uh, I said death by PowerPoint once before. It's a, you know, we have way too many presentations, I'd say. And, uh, but we have to try to communicate all of this information about a very complex experiment to each other. And we also sort of feel that we have to be experts of all systems. And that's not really possible. And that's part of the theme of what I, I'm getting to is what do you do when you clearly are working at a level that's beyond any single person's ability to uh, understand. So one of the things that we did to help that process was invent the World Wide Web. So CERN is where Tim Berners-Lee invented the web browser. Okay, the internet backbone has a longer history, but the web browser was born at CERN to help this kind of communication. So uh, at least there's some precedence uh, for transformative technologies coming out of physics in reaction to new challenges that then end up having an enormous uh, effect in terms of uh, how we do business. Um, so, but the thing that I want to focus on today is really uh, places where I think uh, we're seeing a breakdown of how we do science. Uh, um, and I, I think it's largely, for me, about how we publish. Um, so we still publish in the form of papers, uh, and there's peer review and all of these things, and I have plots, and I have the restriction of two dimensions of a piece of paper, and that's a problem, because a lot of the theories that people are interested in have lots and lots of... Uh, uh, of uh, you know parameters that you can adjust and various things, um, but I, I ended up uh, making changes to my slide to go off script because I heard a, a great analogy uh, earlier today, which was thinking of the big data pipeline as sort of like making wine. You start with collecting the grapes, then you smash the grapes, you take out the seeds, and you clean the data, uh, and then you you bottle it and you try to make a nice bottle of wine, and then the final stage you need to give the bottle of wine to someone uh, for them to consume, and if you give them the wine without a wine opener and a, and a glass, then they can't really do much with it. And so that final stage of consuming the data and making it actionable is, of course, a lot of why people are here. And, and it's, we face the same kind of problem in physics. This way of, of, of publishing our results, I wouldn't even say is like giving them a bottle of wine. I'd say it's like giving them a photo of the bottle of wine. It's like really not sufficient. So we need to do something better. And, and uh, I and some other people have been involved, you know, developing some tools to try to improve that situation and, and, uh, and to change how we publish. And, and I think there's a broader uh, point here, which is when we talk about data, most of the discussions are somehow thinking about data just as sort of entries in a table or something like that. But uh, what, what we want these results to be is not just a number, but somehow something that can do something. It's data and data with sort of a packaging around it that allows you to make certain kinds of, uh, uh, that can do something. You can ask certain kinds of questions. Uh, so it's not just a, uh, it's not just a number. Um, so, so when we, so we hear a lot about data mining and access to the data. Those are certainly things that we deal with, but that's not really my point. We hear about uh, looking for trends and patterns in the data. That's obviously very important and very important part of the scientific method, but that's not really my point either. Um, and then there's, of course, visualizing data, which is important, uh, but that's not really my point either. So, uh, so what is my point? Um, and, and I think, uh, in the end, what we're doing is we're taking a, a theory and we're trying to confront it with the data. And so I'm talking about science, but uh, more broadly, you could imagine uh, I have a policy, a new policy that I want to uh, propose, and I want to see if the data that I've collected support that that policy is going to be effective. Or I have a new business strategy that uh, that I've uh, that I is essentially playing the role of a theory uh, that maybe I was informed from seeing patterns in the data, and now I want to confront that against some data to see if it's going to work. So, so I'm talking about science, but I think the analogy holds more more broadly. So, what kinds of things did we do? So, I'm going to start with something very simple, imagining model modeling data. You, this is sort of my analog for data analytics, uh, but looks more like what I do. And so there's uh, some variable x in my data, and I have a distribution for it, and it looks like a nice bell curve Gaussian distribution. So I'm going to represent it with a graph like that. So the top g means like that's my Gaussian distribution. It depends on the thing that I'm observing, my random variable x, and it has two parameters in it, like the mean and the width of that Gaussian. So you can build more complicated graphs, and that's essentially what we've done, is we, we wanted to figure out how to publish the results of our, uh, of our uh, studies in a, in a nicer way than just a piece of paper. And what we developed was this sort of uh, software suite that allows us to uh, make uh, 
essentially a probability model uh, that you can publish and then you can query uh, later. So it's a very rich form of publishing. Uh, so this example shows eight different measurements. Each one of those little plots was the work of about 20 or 50 people uh, to do serious data mining on our data, try to model it, try to understand it, and then they encapsulate all of their expertise in some part of that graph. And then what was amazing is that that same tool that allowed us to publish our data in a more sophisticated way is also allowing us to, to collaboratively make uh, more complicated statistical models of the data. So we're now, we're, so this is what it looked like about uh, a year and a half ago. Uh, that's about what it looked like maybe nine months ago. And this is what it looked like about three months ago. So in, a, in about a year, we've just completely exploded. And uh, now we're at the point that uh, we don't have algorithms that can deal with the models anymore because we're able to tell a story that's so rich uh, through this collaborative process that we've we've completely uh, changed uh, turned the table from a, a lack of a scientific story to tell that we can make actionable to an engineering problem and I think that's exactly what we want to see is that uh, we were able to capture that wisdom and that knowledge and turn it into an engineering problem so I think that there there are uh, these kinds of things uh, go more broadly, and uh, with that, I'll, I'll end. Thank you very much.